let's go through our reading. Okay, beware. Part three. And by the way, your reading this coming week is going to be the rest of the book. Uh, it's a fast read, and they sort of start throwing more stuff in randomly. Yeah. Sorry, one more question. So the the aspect of throwing out features to to cut down on on development time for the schedule. Uh, relating that to the, the the Webster reading on the arc of engineering. Uh huh. If I'm understanding it correctly, that throwing out of features is trying to avoid the the dip in quality that comes from having to hack things together last minute? Well, the, a lot of the arc of engineering talks about stuff that's already in production. Okay. That's talking about the fact that you tend to, your code quality tends to decline once it's in production and it goes into what's called maintenance, which is actually still about two-thirds adding features, about one-third fixing bugs. That tends to be get to get assigned to entry level people, uh, less competent people that don't feel bad because that's typically entry level. It's like, here, here's this code. I mean, literally, that, that was, those, those were several of my first projects, General Dynamics. Go fix this bug in this code. Uh, and as such, the changes that are made are often sort of the minimum necessary to fix the specific bug or add the specific feature and you tend to lose whatever coherence of architecture and design was there. You get software entropy. Uh, so that's the arc of engineering isn't typically, well actually, it can sort of apply towards project aimed towards shipping, but it's really talking about something that's in production and the reason why it tends to, the quality tends to decline over time. Great, thank you. Okay. I, I cited this on the first day, and this is one of the most important things. People are the most important factor in successful software engineering. Now we're back to Tepes. Talent, experience, professionalism, education, skills. A good team can create excellent software regardless of the technology or the methodology. The problem is, is there aren't enough of you. So the, the, it's flooded out there, as per your earlier readings, the industry is flooded with a lot of frankly incompetent programmers. Uh, that was my discovery 40 odd years ago, 43 years ago when I graduated. It's still true today, in fact it's even more true. Because the demand is so high, a lot of people are taking boot camps, uh, they're learning stuff on YouTube, uh, and saying, oh I'm a developer now, you know, what, what language is, as I've said on Quora, I see these questions daily. What's the best programming language I can learn to have a high paying job in six months? Uh, and there, there is no understanding that most of software engineering is really problem solving. It's learning to gather information. It's knowing where you're ignorant. Uh, it's trying to recognize patterns of what you're doing. And frankly, the language and the operating system to a large extent are relevant. Because you're going to work in multiple languages uh, and on multiple operating systems with multiple libraries, with multiple IDEs, and of course your career, most likely. There are people who go through their, their whole careers and, you know, they, they, there are people who have been programming in COBOL for 50 years. Uh, that's a rarity. The reality is stuff constantly changes. And you have to have the skills and talents to do it. So. Get the right people, keep them happy, and let them do their work. And as per PeopleWare, uh, there's, I think it's probably in the last, yeah, it's, it's a section you're going to read this week, uh, where DeMarco and Lister talk about team aside, uh, and they'll make the comment, we'll talk about this next week, said most organizations don't deliberately set out to destroy teams, they just act that way. Uh, and that's sadly true for a lot of organizations. That is, the, the way management runs, it, it is destructive of forming a good team. Or you get a great team and they're like, oh, this is a great team. Let's break everyone up and send them to different teams. 
uh, it's, it's sort of, <laughs> it's a bit like, you know, what happens in sports. It's like, yeah, we won the World Series. Okay, let's let everyone be free agents and go to, go to other teams. Uh, the <clears throat> people are the most important factor. And the problem is, is that there isn't a lot of good leadership and management in IT. There is in some places. There are, and please understand when you're doing this reading and when I'm talking here, there are places which are outstanding in software development. They have great managers. They have great environments. They treat their people right. The problem is that's not typical. Those are the organizations you look for and you stick with. You have other organizations where management, frankly, doesn't know what it's doing, or they know what they're doing and they don't care. And I've, I've been through, I've been through both, quite frankly. I, my dream job, I mean, I started following the space program when I was eight years old. My dream job was to work for NASA. And a year out of BYU, I did. I got a job with Link Simulations working on the space shuttle flight simulators at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. It was my dream job come true. There were a couple of problems with the job, one of which I think I may have already told you, I really could only work. I only had access to the simulators two hours a week, usually at 1 a.m. on Wednesday nights. And they didn't have a separate test environment. So that was my that was my whole I'm testing out changes to the software and I'm trying to reproduce defects. And then I'd have maybe a day's worth of work and then I'd twiddle my thumbs for for four days, five days, until I had access to the simulator again. And after six months of that I had to leave. Now I might have stayed if it had been a great work environment, but it was like an armed camp between management and engineers. I have never worked in a place like that before or since. They were, we had managers who were outright hostile and abusive towards the engineers. And he seemed to think this was a management technique. It was awful. So I left them after six months. Uh, the part of the problem here is that the, now I talk about professionalism. When I talk about professionalism as a positive quality, I'm talking about playing well with others, getting the work done, showing up, doing your job. For some organizations, professionalism is we want you to wear a slack and dress shirt to come code. It's like, seriously? You know, I'm working 60 hours a week. <laughs> you want me to wear uncomfortable clothes to come program in? Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, on the other hand, you know, other places are far more relaxed. When I was, when, after working in the space shuttle simulator, I went next door to NASA, I worked at the Lunar Planetary Institute, and I was back to programmer clothes like this, you know, jeans, comfortable shirt, not a sweatshirt, it was Houston. Uh, but I, I had harachis. These are sandals I'm from San Diego. They're, they're Mexican sandals. These were tire tread harachis, so the treads were tire leather uppers and so on. And my, we, they did some remodeling about halfway through my time there. My, my cubicle got moved back to this, this newly remodeled building. Uh, it was a stone barn that they'd made the archive and computing center. So we were away from the, the main building. So it was nice. I'd just show up to work. I'd kick my sandals off and I'd, I'd work all day and then, you know, go home. So. This one day, I'm upstairs in the computer room. We have a VAX 11780 there, and I'm at a terminal doing some programming for one of the scientists. And my sandals are downstairs in my cubicle. And Roger Phillips, who's our director of the institute, comes with some VIP guest that he's giving the tour. And I stick my feet under the table as far as I can. You know, I'm sitting at a, a long work table with the, the HP terminal there. And I'm mentally thinking, Roger, ignore me, Roger, ignore me, Roger, ignore me. And Roger, and Roger and I were actually pretty good friends, both from Southern California, and both regretted that LPI was located in Houston rather than Southern California. But Roger comes over with his VIP guest and says, and 
here's our scientific programmer analyst, Bruce Webster, and I can't sit there. I mean, this is this is a guess. So I stand up and shake the hand, and I see Roger look down and look at my feet and just shake his head. <laughs> 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 He gave me some, some pleasant grief about it. <laughs> Webster, you know, keep your shoes on. Uh, anyway, but, but you, will, you will find that there will be corporate things. It's like the corporate thing of, you know, we have your programmers, we want you to do all this work, but we want you there at work at 8 a.m. every morning. Uh, or it's like the story I, I've already told at Pages, where we, there's a group of four programmers who used to take two hour lunches. And our CFO complained, and I said, John, they're, they're working 60 to 70 hours a week. They can take as long lunch as they want, as far as I'm concerned. And they're talking about work anyway half the time. Any, any of you run into these issues in any of your internships or jobs so far where management was insisting on uh, attendance or dress standards that seemed more arbitrary than actually making any kind of sense? Good. Been lucky so far. Okay, leadership. There is a mindset, and this, this, is, this is something that has changed over the decades, but I've run into this. There is an East Coast management mindset that used to be very sort of abusive. It's sort of you, you put the fear of God into your programmers, and that's how you get more work out of them. And you demand that they do this, and you want to track their want to track what they're doing hour by hour and so on. Uh, and the, the result is you tend to drive all the best people away. Yes? You, you call it an, an East Coast um, mm -hmm. approach. Is, is that similar to the Spanish theory mentioned earlier in the book? Spanish theory of think, like get, extracting work out of employees instead of yeah, it's, it's, it, and that's, that's what I'm talking about. We, okay. At Pages, while we're still trying to raise venture funding, the uh, two founders, Vic and Mike, brought in uh, a, an acting CEO who had been at Digital Equipment Corporation, which was an old school computer uh, firm, sort of uh, one of the, not quite a rival to IBM, because no one really rivaled IBM back then, but they like to think themselves as rivals. But it was classic. Uh, East Coast management tended to be very condescending. Uh, saw us, saw us, the development group. Now this is a development group I, I was building from scratch. Before he came in, we've been operating for, for probably a good six to nine months. So Roger showed up and sort of took control and was, you know, imposing certain things and doing certain things and was very harsh and heavy handed. And when we finally closed on venture funding, the, the lead investor, Robert Kibble, spoke to me privately and said, we're looking for candidates for a permanent CEO. He said one of the candidates we're considering is Roger. This person had been acting CEO. Said, what would be your reaction? I said, I would leave within a week. I said, I've only been able to tolerate him because I knew he was an acting CEO, and if you kept him, I would be gone, and I suspect most of the other developers would too. Roger did not get the job of CEO. <laughs> uh, so this is this is a problem. Now, any Again, if any of you have any stories or any questions about issues regarding management that seems overly controlling or harsh or just generally clueless about what you're trying to do. Yes? I had, I was working on a team and... Hold the mascots on here. Um, on a group of, um, here at BYU, I was working with a, like a research group. And the professor that was in charge of it didn't spend a lot of time with it, but he wouldn't, like he would report bugs, but then he wouldn't give us access to the production version, the production server to look at logs. So like he would report a bug, and then we couldn't go look at the logs. <laughs> to see what the actual To see was. what was actually going on. <laughs> so like, 
we get a bug report like, we can't really do anything unless we can look at what's going on. And there are like other weird, strict things like that that were just kind of like. Did, did he have any justification for that? Did he claim? Yes, I know of. I left after a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I was a yes. little bit frustrated with that. And it, it, yeah, that's and, and, and that's what happens is you drive away, you drive away your best people, that kind of stuff. Now, as far as hiring, how many of you have been on job interviews already? What are the things that you like least about the job interviews? Yes? Having to dress up. Having to dress up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a job interview. <laughs> what else? What are, some of the, what are some negative experiences you've had during job interviews? Yes? Um, whoever's interviewing me doesn't give me enough time to think through things. Like, they won't give me just a second of quiet for me to, like, think about the problem they're giving me. Rather, they think that, oh, I didn't have a solution immediately, therefore I must not know what I'm doing. Yeah? Yes? It's like when they don't give me any time to, like, ask them questions and to find out about the position. This is like I had an interview where it was just like question after question. They're asking me questions like, tell, us, tell me about the three biggest achievements of your career. And I'm all like, I'm like a senior. I'm a student. Yeah. <laughs> I passed. Yes. Yes. Uh, when, when questions in the job interview don't really reflect what I'll be doing in the job, I actually, I actually got a job where the job interview was um, a whiteboard with a line of output from a Linux shell, ls-l, et cetera, and it showed um, file permissions and all that and asked me what, what all these mean. And then in the job, I was writing C code in a several hundred thousand line code base involving uh, bit level operations and uh, performance performance as a major constraint. It's completely you unrelated. May, you may, yeah, you may remember the, one of the cartoons, the very first lecture I gave, as interview process, you know, invert this binary tree, actual job, make this button bigger. <laughs> uh, which, which, ironically, my, my uh, daughter Chris, uh, one of her first jobs, was to make a button bigger. <laughs> That's a working software at her, at her job. Anyway. I'd rather go that way where it's easier on the job. Yes, than, 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 what's, yes. than what I got. It was understood. Yes. I just had a question. So um, I've talked to a couple of people who work in CS, and they kind of what they say is uh, whenever they solve a problem, like making a button bigger, you know, it might be one line of code that you add, but then they say they take like a week to do it. That way the company thinks that for that week they were trying to figure out how to make the button bigger. Would you consider that unethical or would you consider that? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Here's the problem. <laughs> and and this, this, this is a very serious dilemma. I'm, I'm thinking back, I was called in with some other people from OSG to a uh, major, major credit card company. Their development team had released version 1.0 of this, this new, re-engineered from the ground up, customer facing website for the credit card customers. And against all odds, they had actually managed to deliver it on, deliver it on schedule. But they had, I mean, the developers said, we, we have all this technical debt. This is, this is really a chewing gum and bailing wire put together site. We need to clean up a lot of stuff. Management's decision was to say, here are all the features we want in version 2.0. And since you did this in you know, six months, we want this new one in three months. And it was actually the development managers who brought us in to say, Help us, please, because we can't make management understand that we need to spend three to six months simply cleaning up all the quick and dirty stuff we did to get this thing live. Uh, and we did the analysis, and then we, bet, we went to upper management and said, look, here are all the things they really do need to clean up. Here is a limited subset of new features of the ones that you want, which they feel they can successfully implement in this time frame while retiring the technical debt. And to management's credit, management actually listened to us. 
uh, as, as, a, as a consultant, one of the things I learned when I moved from software development to consulting, I remember telling one of my, my fellow consultants, I said, they're not paying me the big bucks to do what I'm actually really good at, which is software architecture and design. They're paying me a lot of money to tell them something they could find out if they simply spent five minutes talking to their engineers in the trenches. And that sums up a lot of the consulting work I've done over the years. What I do is I go and talk to the engineers in the trenches, and usually, you know, it takes more than five or ten minutes, but by the time I've talked to, say, ten, actual engineers and team leaders, I can pretty much tell you exactly what the key problems are and what needs to be done to change. But management doesn't listen to them. They listen to us because we're, we're high paid consultants and we have these impressive credentials and so on. They could have simply found, I actually, one of the last consulting jobs I ever did, we were in this thing of expressing findings and I, I literally said to them, I said, I don't know, and this, this made Tony Gibson, who was, who was my effective boss for this, and the one bringing us in really mad, but I said, I don't know why he brought us in. I said, you have got really bright, talented engineers here who have been trying to tell you the same thing that we're telling you here now. You could have just listened to them. Of course, Tony afterwards hit me and said, don't you ever say that. This, this is our business. <laughs> But, but the, the point is, is uh, I don't think I'd stretched out a week, but I might add a little extra test and verification time to make sure I saw everything through. Because the problem is, is that they will often come back and say, oh, well, here are these other 10 features we want you to add, and we expect you to do these just as fast. And we're back again to the other cartoon I showed. It's the difference between the, oh yeah, I can do that in five minutes, and oh yeah, that's impossible stuff. And management doesn't, doesn't understand that. Uh, diversity becomes a bonus. I, I <coughs> Here, here, are, here are my two or three lessons. First, bring in people because they're qualified. Second, try not to hire people who are all the same because you will get bad group thinking. You want people who have different experiential backgrounds, who bring different perspectives to what you're doing. And third, err on the side of hiring too few people. Again, as with, with the, the snow removal and just four people working, <clears throat> it puts sort of a work burden on you, but at the same time, it makes communication very fast and very easy. My standard thing, in fact, I think it was in my opening slide, is, if not, it's in my closing lecture. I would rather have a small team of very bright people than a large team of very bright people. And we'll talk some about some of the interpersonal conflicts in that. Uh, ta -da -ta, ta -da -ta. Yeah, it's the issue with continue. <clears throat> when you get out in the real world, look for ways to block off inter interruption. Whether that's time shifting your work, whether it's just simply turning off Discord or Slack or your phone or whatever. Uh, do that. Okay, let's talk about turnover. The, uh, if you are, let's see, uh, and, and this is further on me. Have you guys read The Dead Sea Effect already? Was that one of the early ones? Yeah. I can't tell you how pervasive that is. <coughs> and that management, unless they are very proactive and very thoughtful, will tend to drive away their best people. Now, as, as a number of studies have indicated, or at least strongly suggested, the number one reason people leave is their immediate supervisor. Number one pe reason people stay is their immediate supervisor. 
my daughter Crystal, even though there were things she was unhappy with about the company she was working for up until just about now, I'm not sure when her two weeks notice expires, uh, <clears throat> is that she had an absolutely wonderful direct manager. And it was her loyalty to the manager who kept it there. Well, her manager <laughs> got a job elsewhere about two or three months ago. And as soon as that happened, Chris started looking for a new job. Found a great new job, and uh, we'll be starting that uh, within a week or two. But companies, and, and companies, of course, don't think. So we're talking about specific people in the management chain often fail to recognize that loyalty is a two-way street. It's kind of like, you should be grateful to that we're giving you a job and, you know, it doesn't matter how badly we manage it or how much we, you know, abuse or cause problems for you. You should be grateful and the good people go. It's hard to hire good people. It took me a year and a half to hire the entire development team at Pages. And I was fortunate that we were still in a fundraising mode that I didn't have immediate pressure to get the whole team put together. But I went through hundreds of resumes to get to the 10 that we ended up with. And there were only a few, I only can think of one offhand, that I actually offered a job to that they didn't take it. Uh, and he's rich and famous up in Redmond now, so that's that's probably suggests why he didn't take the job. <laughs> it was, uh, Edward Jung, J J U N G, uh, became a big wig at Microsoft and uh, helped co-found uh, Intellectual Ventures, which is a big patent holding company up there. <clears throat> I've already mentioned, I think. The, in fact, I'm pretty sure I have, that, that our CFO at Page is John Curry, looking, as, as a good CEO does, for places to cut money, wanted to eliminate the free snacks and soft drinks. And I said, John, if we lose just one developer, you, you literally can't spend enough on m and and soda to make up for the money we will lose by losing one developer and having the product laid there by. <clears throat> That is something that management has a hard time recognizing, the cost of turnover. There is, there is a mindset still in a lot of management that we are all replaceable cogs. One of the extra credit readings in Webster 7 is, as I've mentioned this before, is an article that Ruby Riley and I did called The Longest Yard that uses a sports team analogy. And it really is more like a sports team and as we've seen, even great sports teams have a hard time repeating. <laughs> Any Chiefs fans here? Uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it's hard enough to do this successfully time and again without driving your best people away. And it's hard to hire the best people. I believe I already mentioned Bruce Henderson, close friend and colleague, is trying to build his development team, and he has very high standards as to who will hire. And he says, I have a hard time finding anyone who's really good, who's really available. They're all in good, solid, well-paying positions. They're quite happy where they're at. So what you want to do is you want to be very good at what you do, and you'll be in high demand, and you can change jobs. Except when the market collapses, which I went through in 88, 89. That's a whole other story we'll talk about. Different time. Any observations, personal experiences, where you've, you've had problems with either an immediate manager or problems just with management in general, the place you've been an intern or working? Anyone? Sounds like it's all been good for you. Okay. Layoffs for the sake of layoffs can easily trigger a negative downward spiral. We had layoffs at Pages. We lost two of our engineers. And things were never quite the same after that. It's not why we closed a year later. It's because we picked the wrong horse to ride. That's another lecture. 
fact, it may be one of them for today. The, but the information that walks out the door, we're, we're back to armor and the experience that a given developer may have, things that she or he has tried that didn't work, or tried and did work, you lose that person, and often that knowledge goes with them, and you have to restart that level of investigation and research. I, I think we talked about the disarmor, but have any of you had experiences where someone who had critical knowledge left, left a team or a project you were on, and it had a negative impact? You're going to get head shaking here. Uh, yeah, hugely. Um, I, my first student job here on campus, we were we built one side to another. None of the full time employees were technical. There was two full time managers, and one was a help desk person, and the other person just managed. And so all of the website knowledge of how the 60 plus systems work was passed down from one student to the next. Oh, and man. In that chain, one student left too quickly. <laughs> and it was chaos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That's, that's poor management. You want, you want to make sure you've got. Redundancy and documentation here. Uh, sometimes you can't avoid the layoffs. So, and this was this was an article I wrote back uh, when there was a lot. We were in the middle of a recession, and there were a lot of organizations that were having to downsize IT. And I listed these things first. What you want to do if you're going to have layoffs is find the other performers. You want to keep your best people happy and on board. That can be hard. That's what you want to do. Don't cut tools and benefits because you'll drive everyone away. If you have to reduce, reduce the people. But don't suddenly say, okay, yeah, we're, we're laying people off, and by the way, no more free peanuts and soda, and we want you here eight to five every day, and you, your whole team will be gone. Yes? Um, when you say get rid of underperformers, my general impression of getting fired from a job means that there was like a serious problem, like a, a, something that couldn't be resolved by a change of behavior. When you say get rid of underperformers, does that mean firing the people who are the, the bottom whatever percent? Well, it's laying them off. Okay. Have you ever been through a layoff? I have. I've laid myself off before. <laughs> um, no, true. I, it was a small software company. I was the developer in charge of a product line, and I had to go ahead to hire a second developer, went through interviews, hired this nice guy out of Boston, he relocated to San Diego, and like three weeks after I did this, the president of the company said, oh, finances aren't great, you're going to have to lay someone off. Well, my two choices were me or the guy who just moved from Boston. <laughs> And I was pretty clear as to the direction the company was going. So I laid myself off, and I told the guy from Boston, this is what I'm doing. I'm laying myself off. You can take over everything here. But if I were you, I would start looking for another job now. I'm not sure how long this company is going to be around. Uh, at Pages, we closed our doors. Uh, at Price Waterhouse, I was laid off. It was the recession of 2001. And they were cutting down. They were basically shrinking the whole company size, and any practice that they didn't deem sufficiently profitable, which meant sufficiently profitable for the people at the partner level, they got rid of. So basically, they gave me a severance package, they, I had 10 active cases, they gave me five outright, and then hired me back as a consultant for the other five, so it was as soft a lane as you could ask for. It. And that's pretty much when I started working for myself, I've been working for myself ever since. The uh, so that was that was that was sort of a nice transition there. But this is this is a case where if you have to have a reduction in force, you need to evaluate the IT team, and you want to try and keep functioning teams together, and you want to look for the people who are contributing the least, or will it will hurt the least to lose them. Uh, plus, as noted, you want to shape the teams that you're keeping to fit the projects which you're going for. In other words, it's going to say. Okay, you know, if we're having genuine layoffs, genuine reduction in force, 
we're not going to be able to maintain all the same projects we have. Which projects are we canceling? Which ones are we keeping? Let's keep the team teams intact that can work on these projects. And do it quickly because if you drag it out, if, if everyone knows layoffs are coming, but they don't know who it is or when it's going to happen, you know what they're going to do? They're going to find new jobs. They're not going to wait for that because, and this is, this is a rule for all of you if you're unhappy in a job, a lot of companies will not hire people who are unemployed. They won't state that, but that's often a screening factor because it's, it's, a, it's an easy HR screening factor. Well, if she doesn't have a job, then obviously she's no good. So we won't even bother interviewing her. It's always best to find a job while you still have a job. It's easier, it's more effective, you have less to explain. And if you don't like the job you're interviewing for, you still have a job, so to speak. Any questions? Yes? This is more of an observation. So you're saying that it's you want to get rid of the underperformers, you want to keep your best people, uh, and this is like a company possibly going under scenario. That seems like a very difficult balance since it's probably your best people that are costing you the most money as well, right? It, is, it, it may well be your best people that are costing you the most money. So yes, you do have that issue. And if the company is simply having to do a reduction because you're on revenues, you missed your revenue targets, uh, you're having to cut overall spending across the company or whatever, it's still better to try and keep your best people. Uh, otherwise, you really are, you're simply introducing the Dead Sea effect yourself. You're getting rid of your best people, keeping your, your least productive people, and that starts you on a downward spiral. Yes? It's on that second bullet. Sorry. Um, I've just seen the exact opposite in the industry that I've seen. They invest in individuals, and it's better for them to drop benefits. Like when COVID hit for a company, I, I saw them drop the 401k benefit for six months so they didn't have to lay off any people during that part of time because they saw the people as a better investment and not losing any of those people than the benefits. But I can see how that might introduce the Dead Sea. That's actually, well, no, no, that's, and there, there's a very good argument to make. If you're trying to say this is a temporary measure to tide us over until things can can resume. It's, it's, again, with, with my daughter Crystal, uh, her company, when COVID hit, basically went to a hoteling approach. So they reduced their office space. Basically, they had everyone working from home with, a, you know, for the most part, only very occasional meetings in place that you came in, you had a, a workspace that you could do, but most of your work was from home. So yes, I, I think a fair argument can be made for that. If you've got a lot of great people and you really don't want to lose any of them, but people tend to be the expensive part. Now, if you're cutting benefits, like 401k, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, no, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to go find a job where I can keep my 401k. Uh, so it's, it's <clears throat> layoffs are never easy. They're always painful. Uh, like I said, having been, having been through them myself, I know just what they're like. Uh, and uh, it's a fact of life. The IT industry is very volatile. Uh, companies sometimes overreach or they're affected by bubbles popping. There was a tech bubble in the mid 80s that popped uh, in 1988. I got caught in that one. Uh, there was a tech bubble in the late 90s, the dot com boom, which I saw coming a mile away and warned people, friends against. In fact, I have a Friend who this, to this day thanks me because about two years, about 1998, I was giving a lecture at a private tech conference and said, between the dot-com bubble and Y2K, said this is the amount of spending that's going on with Y2K. This is going to be so ugly. So he moved all his retirement funds out of out of stocks, and uh, for years has thanked me. Said he saved my retirement because I, I moved it all to to safer more stable things because NASDAQ hit its peak in March of 2000 and then dropped. And it took 17 years for the NASDAQ average to get back to where it was in March of 2000. Uh, my personal opinion is we're in a tech bubble right now. There's far too many unicorns. Uh, there are far too many companies, much like 2000, far too many companies like Twitter and face Facebook where it's kind of like I'm not sure I see the the value proposition, where are they getting their money from? Uh, 
So the ones that go public are the safer ones, but it's, it's, it tends to be a bit of a shell game. And again, I've already mentioned here uh, Theranos. Uh, if you read uh, Bad Blood uh, by John uh, Horibaru, or watch The Inventor, and you, you will see a classic tech bubble collapse. Likewise, uh, WeWork, there's a documentary on WeWork, which uh, you, you see the same thing. This inflation, this invent, all this investment money chasing uh, these startups, and then the startups don't pan out. Okay. I apologize if the readings didn't match what they were supposed to be, but okay. Technology and life cycles in sync. Uh, I've seen this time and again over the years. There are there are. And again, I'm, I'm assuming you've read the article. There are technologies that look really cool that, that don't quite pan out. Uh, they, never, they never really you think this is going to happen, and then it just never really comes to market. Uh, that's the Firefly. Or it gets released, and it's really not all it shook out to be. Uh, that's pretty much what happened with Theranos, was the underdone. They, 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 pushed out this technology and it turned out not at all to meet the all the various claims that have been made. <clears throat> Conveyor belt is simply recognizing that technologies have a life a lifespan and go away. Uh, how many versions of Windows have I used? I think 3.1 was probably the earliest. So 3.1, 95, 98, ME, the worst Windows ever. Uh, and no, seriously. Seriously, Windows, just, just ask, ask people who are old like me. Windows Millennium Edition was just so atrocious. I actually ordered a, life, a laptop after ME came out, and I, ordered, I specifically requested that 98 be installed instead. Uh, NT, uh, XP, which was actually really good solid Windows. And then you had <coughs> uh, Vista, which was another disaster. Uh, absolute disaster. In fact, it's sort of it's kind of like Star Trek movies, it's like alternating versions were good or bad. Uh, so, you know, Emmy was a disaster, XP was great, Vista was horrible. Uh, Windows 7 was good. Windows 8 was like, why, why even bother with Windows 8? Uh, and then they just decided to skip Windows 9, went to Windows 10, which I'm fine with. I'm seeing this stuff for Windows 11. It's kind of like, you know, guys, really, do you have anything new to say? Uh, and there are some, some uh, technologies which are basically dead on arrival. Uh, the, one of the earliest and most famous ones, and of course this is before any of you were born, and in some cases maybe before your parents were born. IBM, after introducing the IBM PC, decided they wanted to do a consumer computer. So they came out with the IBM PC Junior, which was such a bad piece of technology that they literally ended up burying units in landfills. Uh, it was an absolute disaster as a product and just died almost instantly. And IBM didn't really try to address the consumer market. They basically tried to make a toy version of the computer. It was just really bad. Uh, they couldn't compete with everything else that was out there. Uh, any questions or comments on any of these? This is just simply to recognize that there are technologies that may not live up to the hype or may die before you're willing to have them happen. You have to live with that. Arc of engineering. This is, and, and as per my comment, this is not really in the development cycle. This is in after it's gone into production. You reach a point where it's it's gone into production. You know, the, the, you continue to make improvements. You're adding new features. It's getting better, unless you have very careful attention to the maintenance cycle. 
software rot, software entropy sets in. You have changes that are made by people who do not understand the overall architecture and design of the software. <clears throat> and things get increasingly fragile. You get more and more very technical debt. And the system becomes harder and harder to successfully improve. And you get bugs that live forever. Uh, <clears throat> so this is, this is something to be aware of. I, I suspect some of you may have seen this in some commercial applications and so on. There are bugs in my, I've been using Microsoft Word for 30 years. There are bugs, formatting bugs, still in Microsoft Word that drive me nuts. It just have never been cleaned up, despite some major rewrites and changes to the actual file architecture. Uh, any questions or comments on this? Yes. So uh, going back to the point where uh, you're having developers working on a system they did not originally architect and that being a problem. So even if you have this, even if you still have the original architect around, how, what's the best practice to add features that were not in your original architecture? <coughs> the, well actually, and, and one of the other articles is in here. No, it's not. Uh, Maybe in, in one of your other readings, or maybe in the extra credit reading. Article, I, I propose having a maintenance architect, which is someone who understands all the legacy systems. And so when a change is proposed, this person basically says, okay, here are the trade-offs you're looking at. If you change this, this is what it's likely going to take to, to make this change, uh, to add this feature, or to fix this bug. Make sure you've got the cost. Make sure you're taking the time to do it. The problem is companies don't want to spend that time and money figuring out the best way to do it. They just want it there. They want to release a feature. They want to quicken, you know, dirty bug fix, even though you have a, and there are various figures that are cited as far as the percentage chance of a change introducing a new bug or reawakening an old one. 15% is one that's bandied about. I don't know if there's actually any really solid studies about it. But the simple chance is, any time you change, you make a change to an existing system, there is a risk of introducing a defect or reawakening one that was fixed at some point. So uh, with the architect, the, the idea is to say, here is the, here's what we're facing. If you want to make this change, this is what's going to have to happen. Here are the risks. Here is where you most want to make the change. This, this is some area that you may need to rework to make this go in cleanly. So the architect can say that. Whereas if you have someone who's just like you, who's just graduated, and say, oh yeah, go fix this bug or go add this feature to the software, and you've got you know, 50,000 lines of code that, that may be four or five years old, <laughs> or if you're in a corporate setting, maybe 20 or 30 years old, uh, and you're saying, okay, I have to figure out how to fix this. How do I dig through this? How do I figure out where the problem is and how do I make sure that I'm not breaking anything else? And oh, by the way, management wants this next week. Okay, entrenchment of technology. This is me 25 years ago, 1996. Windows may still be dominant in 2025, nearly 30 years from now. Guess what? Here's Windows on desktop. It's that blue section. This is 25 years later. Uh, it's slowly declining, but not much. But the, the point is, is that technology has a tendency to stretch itself. Yes? Well, that chart does not include mobile devices, correct? No, it doesn't. Okay. And that's something I talk about. Yeah. The uh, here's the problem, and this this is a general problem you have to realize. Technology entrenches itself. One of the classic examples of this is the internal combustion engine. We have over the last hundred years built up a massive infrastructure for internal combustion cars. Thousands of gas stations, thousands of repair stations. Lots of expertise, no manufacturing, no solution, no problems. And it's hard to displace 
entrenched technology. My own observation is that in order to displace entrenched technology, you have to have something that can be used side by side. Now, I'm old enough to have grown up with vinyl records, and I remember when CDs came out. In fact, I bought my first CD player in 1985, and at that time, you'd walk into Tower Records, and it was all vinyl and cassettes, and probably eight tracks still. And they had like one rack of CDs. And I basically watched as that all reversed to where you had, you know, maybe a couple shelves of vinyl, and it was all CDs. But the thing about CDs is you didn't have to give up vinyl. I had a turntable and a CD player. I could listen to both. I didn't have to choose between the two. It's hard to do that with other technologies. Sometimes you've got one technology that's preventing uh, a possibly better technology from moving in. And even Microsoft, literally for 25 years, has struggled with this backward compatibility issue. There are things they keep trying to kill off, things they'd like to rework. They've achieved some, but they're still chained to what they have. <coughs> the, uh, that's that. But, as for your point, mobile devices. I don't have to choose between my laptop, my smartphone, my tablet, or my desktop. I can use whichever one is easiest for me. And that's why mobile devices have exploded so much. You didn't have to say, well, I have to give it. If I had to give up my laptop to use a smartphone, I'd still have my laptop. There's too much critical stuff I have to do on that. So that's, but just be aware of how technology entrenches itself. One of the greatest blessings for the IT industry was the year 2000 problem. Because it allowed, forced, but also allowed, a lot of companies to retire a lot of systems that they, they would still probably be running 20 years later now otherwise. I'll, I'll be, be happy to talk, we won't do it today, but I'm happy to talk about Y2K because I got sucked into it. I know. <laughs> I know that inside and out. I testified three times before Congress on it. Let's Your next assignment as a team. Okay, architecture and design. Uh, as I've I already mentioned, I think I mentioned this in an earlier class, the uh, department is actually considering doing a 400 level software architecture class, which I think would be excellent. Architecture is a tricky subject. Because you'll find I, I have probably four or five texts in software architecture, and they can't even seem to agree quite on a definition. <laughs> uh, my working definition is simply it's it's how we're going to build it and why we're building it that way. In other words, these are the things that are important to us. These are the qualities or aspects that we need to make this successful. And it's laying the technical groundwork and conceptual groundwork so that it encompasses the set of solutions uh, or the set of problems that we want to solve. Uh, I've already mentioned, for example, the April design model in pages. Asking Vic for, you know, give me the most bizarre design model that we're ever likely to support. And by his doing that, it forced me to draw a much bigger conceptual circle for the pages architecture. Because I kept having to say, okay, you know, if I do this as this, I'll handle all these, but I won't handle April. So I've got to expand my approach and make sure the technology is sufficiently flexible, sufficiently powerful to it. That actually paid off big time. Because after we shipped pages, we shipped in March of 94, and in the summer, I had someone at Next Computer say, you guys should look into the stuff that's coming out of 
Switzerland, this worldwide web stuff that Tim Lee is doing. Uh, and we looked at it and said, oh, we can do this easy. Our architecture makes this a no-brainer. So we actually, in a four-month release cycle, turned our desktop publishing system into a drag-and-drop web page editor. WYSIWYG. You literally, you just simply drag elements off a palette and lay out your whole web page and punch a button and it would spit out the HTML. And it did that because the architecture had great phones. And we already had a structured document architecture underlying it. It was actually extremely, we knew what all the elements were. We knew what a paragraph was. We knew what a headline was and so on. Everything was a separate object type. It was very easy to simply say, oh yeah, we're just going to wrap this with an H1 and an H1 and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, with architecture, you want to focus on the connection interfaces among subsystems. What are your subsystems? And I, I think I've already told the story for Eric, uh, but I'll tell it again because it's relevant. I was brought in to help him because it had a disastrous design review. And as I mentioned, one of the first things I did coming in, this is my first consulting job, I, I said, who's the chief architect? And, the, the director of the division didn't know. So I went around, literally, to the entire development team, about 30 people all together, and asked, who's the chief architect of this project? I got five different answers. Uh, and the number one answer was no one, which actually turned out to be the accurate answer. Because there was no architecture. There were four subsystems. There were actual diagrams for the subsystems. And literally, when I took the four diagrams and put them on a table in front of me, I could not successfully complete them. Each subsystem had been designed and was being developed without respect to an overall architecture or the other subsystems, or they were assuming interfaces that just didn't exist or were wrong. And so one of the things I had to do was to come up with an architecture for the whole system. This is the network management system for the uh, Iridium phone satellite project. And then rework the four subsystems so that they all fit within the architecture. <clears throat> the part of it depends on what's important. In pages, as I've mentioned, one of the critical things is the delay between when a user typing a document presses a key and when the letter appears on the screen. That has to be a small fraction of a second. Otherwise, people will not use your product. So a big architectural consideration at Pages was, how do we make that update cycle so tight that as soon as that key press is hit, we get something on the screen, even if we have to do delay doing the reformatting, but at least the user can type as fast as they want to type, and the text appears there. And I was a good beta tester because I'm a relatively fast touch typist. Decisions on what the technologies were. That was one of the decisions uh, at Pages. I was prototyping using the Next Step operating system because they had outstanding prototyping tools and interface builder. It was very easy to do quick and dirty stuff. And at some point, we were, decide, we were making a decision what's going to be our target deployment platform. And we decided to go for Next Step, which I like to say, you know, seemed like a good idea at the time. It's the reason we closed doors, because Next Step never really achieved any market share. But it didn't matter to see jobs because eventually Apple, which couldn't come up with a new operating system, bought Next, and they turned Next Step into Mac OS X. Uh, and the important thing for all of you who are, who are the chief architects among your teams, raise your hands. Okay. Architecture is a political act. You have to know how to enroll everyone else on the team. You have to listen to them, and you have to get their buy-in on those key concepts. Architecture, software architecture is a political act. It is a balancing act. Especially if you've got bright, talented, well-educated team members, they're going to have strong opinions. 
And you have to find a way to meld that into something everyone can agree upon. Because as per chapter four in Brooks, conceptual integrity is critical for system development. You have to be on the same page. Comments or questions? Uh, so, what do you want for your architecture? And these, these are literally definitions out of two different books. So you've got one that says it's the most abstract depiction of the system, constrains all subsequent refinements, so it's basically defining the space in which you're doing, you're doing your design and development. Another set of authors say, well, you have the computational components, interactions, correspondence between requirements and elements, clarify structurals and semantic differences among components. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, the, at Pages, as I mentioned, my architecture was three diagrams. One was the composition diagram of a document. That is the set of the, the nest, increasingly nested set of object classes that comprised, that composed the document. The document comprised these various object classes. The second was, here are the subsystems, and this is sort of the uh, first bullet point under the second section up there. The second diagram I created said, here are the major subsystems and here's how they're talking to each other. And then because this was 1990 and it was object technology and so on, the third one was my object class diagram. And it used a parallel structure where you had four general types of objects that were relevant and then you would have those for each of the uh, different document elements and basically, it was a model view controller approach before I knew what model view controller was. But you had something that held the data, something that did the representation, something that actually allowed you to work on it. And there was a fourth one. If I never find those diagrams, I'll bring them in. Uh, so, SpinRAD, an approach to software architecture, top level design, functional, physical, and operational. You want to figure out how to partition it. You want to figure out how you're going to do it. And you want to make it that it will grow as you decide to add new features and qualities. Comments or questions so far? This is a poor substitute for a whole class on software architecture. There you go. Uh, so what I want your architecture to include. First, I want you to include why, as the start of your architecture document, why customers will like your product. Because that's got to drive everything you do. If your customers have no reason to like your product, why are you even building it? So, then have a top level diagram, and I'll, I'll get these, I will, I promise to get these slides up today. Or maybe tomorrow. Uh, I want a top level diagram showing your major subsystems and interaction fund. This doesn't have to be terribly complex. It really doesn't. This is, and, and once again, I will say go and look at prior semesters. Look at their documents. Feel free to copy the format and outline the documents. Heck, if they have diagrams that match yours, you know, just file off the serial numbers and put the names of your elements in there. The idea is to have something, this is something that your team has to be working on and has to agree on. So, what are the major subsystems? Document any explicit choices or trade-offs you have. In other words, why you're doing stuff and why you're not doing stuff. Remember, with requirements, you're supposed to define, you know, here's what we're not going to do. Well, it's the same thing with architecture. Now this is this is a reflection of your requirements. You're going to say, okay, because we're doing X and we're not doing Y, we, we can do this and uh, figure out how this all works together. 
<clears throat> this is another reason. These are things to consider as far as quality goals. This is a useful list. Uh, I'm pretty sure I got this from uh, Jerry Weinberg from one of his books. This is, these are useful ways to think of what you're building and why it's important and which ones matter. Performance may not matter, reliability may. On the other hand, you know, functionality, you're, you're probably all reducing functionality, so that's not an issue. Uh, for the purposes of this class, you're probably not concerned about competitiveness, you're probably not concerned about compatibility unless you're directly interacting with some other existing system. Uh, this is for this class, you probably don't care about lifespan. Uh, and to a certain extent, you don't care about the fun, you're just demoing stuff. Ditto for support. Uh, you can have quick and dirty coding in here. I won't look at your code. Uh, and all you really care about are the demos. And you really don't care about the cost because you're doing this all for free and it's for a class. But these, these are, this is a very useful list to keep handy because it gives you a way of thinking of software. When you want to build something, these are the questions that you have to answer. What's important and how are you going to make this work? Questions, comments, observations? Looking at your watch, and I saw that. Anyway. <laughs> It's okay, it's, it's, we're about that time. I tried to get you out of here in an hour and a half. Uh, the design is this, are the solutions to implement the architecture. Say, like, okay, here's our architecture. These are our design solutions. We're gonna do this, we're not gonna do this. Uh, we wanna drag in patterns, we wanna drag in, uh, at this point, architecture in theory is, is sort of, and I say sort of because often it usually isn't, sort of independent of your implementation decisions, but now in design it's like, here's, here's our implementation, here are the technologies we're using, uh, here are patterns we're using, here are common uh, uh, communications, this is the back end, this is what we're using, uh, here are the, the module interfaces, here are coding standards and guidelines. And when we get to the lecture on Quality assurance, we'll talk more about that. Deep interfaces. Deep interfaces are a big stumbling block. I, I assume all of you have done programming using someone else's APIs. Okay? So a shallow interface is the API that says, here's the call, here are the set of parameters. And this is what it does. The deep interface is what says, I have to call this first, and then I have to call this, and then I have to call one of these two, and then I have to finish up by calling that. Often the deep interface is not documented. Often the deep interface is what you go searching for online at Stack Overflow or elsewhere. And say, look, I know I've got these three or four things I should be calling, but I don't know what I should do when it returns this error message, or I don't know the order in which I have to call them. So in your own design, Make sure that you are clear among your team of what the deep interfaces are. In other words, if I'm doing a portion of the application, I have to say, here are these five calls. This is how you use them. This is the order in which they're called. And if you get this, you should do this. And this is how you handle errors, and so on and so forth. Uh, your specific deliverables may depend on whatever methodology you're using. Uh, so. Here's my suggested approach. To find what you're doing, give an overview of the system architecture, subsystems connections, divisions based on your approach, which is typically front end, back end, database design specifics, so on. Uh, fill in enough details to allow implementation for the design. This last one is the one that I really want you to focus on. Identify the hard problems up front and prioritize them. Because that's what you'll stumble over. You you're like six weeks away at this point from your first demo. Make sure you all know what the hardest problems are because first that will get you to start cutting back on features. 
The easiest way to get rid of a hard problem is to get rid of the feature that causes the hard problem. <laughs> no, seriously. The easiest way to get rid of ignorance is to, to get rid of the feature where you don't know how you're going to solve it. And again, I strongly suggest go to other prior semesters and look at the documents. So, I want your first draft on your team wiki by Saturday midnight. Uh, and next Monday, I'm going to have each chief architect uh, explain briefly the rationale for your approach in architecture design. So I'm looking for like one to two minutes per, per team. You've got a stats report, team stats report due. You've also got podcast number three due. Next week, read the rest of Peopleware and Webster 5, and I hope that's the right stuff for Webster 5. Uh, I'll go back and check all the other things. Any questions at this point? Oh, you're always, always so anxious to get out. <laughs> <laughs> now I can lecture for another hour. I can hold you here for another hour. <laughs> or you can get up and leave. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Have a good week. Uh, please DM me to remind me to fix the Webster form five readings. And feel free to DM me if you have any questions.